Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to do a first chapter reads video. I've not done one of these for a little while, but I took five books off my shelves this morning, all of which are on my reading plan for 2023, and I've read the first chapter of them all to see which one I'm most excited for and I might continue with next month. So the books I've chosen for today's first chapter reads are all from my reading plan for 2023, as I say, and they're from two key areas of that. I've got two books from my list of 10 self-published titles that I want to read, and then the other three are all opening books of series that I want to read as well. So I'm going to go through them in the order I read them, which is by uh, shortest to longest chapter, starting at nine pages, and then the longest chapter was 23 pages. First of all, I've got Ascendant by Michael R. Miller, which is one of the self-published books in my list. I've then got The Chunkiest of the Batch, which is Legacy of Ash by Matthew Ward. Then it's a former self-published book. This one is The Grey Bastards by Jonathan French. The second title from my actual self-published list is An Ocean of Others by Joshua Scott Edwards. And then the final book in today's selection is Blood of an Exile by Brian Nasland. So as I say, I'm going to go through these from shortest to longest chapter first, which means we start off with Ascendant. And this one, I didn't get too much from the opening chapter, largely because it is only nine or so pages. Uh, we start off with a cook's boy who's gone into the town to pay uh, for goods, essentially. There's a feast that's going to be happening that evening. He's the son of a cook, so he's going off to pay the butcher and fishmonger and others for the uh, meats, essentially, that they're providing for the feast. The feast is in celebration of a dragon rider who the cook's boy is hoping to get all of his jobs out of the way in time to be able to see because it's obviously a big thing, something to be really celebrated. He runs into the blacksmith who's not a very happy chap and that interaction and the interaction with the butcher gives us a bit of information. It tells us that uh, meat and foodstuffs are scarce, although that could be because the castlers kind of bought everything up for the feast that they're having that evening. But it does seem that meat is not too bad because there are lots of sheep and cows and so forth that have been ordered and the only thing that's not able to be provided is an elk. The cook has asked for two elks and he's only got one so that doesn't seem too bad but the conversations do suggest that groceries in general are a little bit scarce. The boy goes outside and there's a bit of a commotion at the city gates and when they're opened a load of blooded soldiers come in. There's wagons which are obviously carrying the dead or the very badly injured and then a dragon lands and the dragon rider calls the boy over to him. So it doesn't give us too much, but it does give us a bit of information about the world. It tells us that there are lots of different types of dragons that we do get uh, kind of uh, verbally introduced to. We don't actually see any until that dragon right at the end, but there are lots of types of dragons and we learn that they're all very different, at least in their mannerisms and what they like to eat. So there's a bit of world building already in this short opening chapter. It does read absolutely fine. It's one that I could definitely continue with but it doesn't really suck me in. I think the hook is there right at the end, what's happened to the soldiers, and presumably we'll be finding the answers to that in the next couple of chapters. So the next book, as I say, is the big chonker of the collection. This is Legacy of Ash by Matthew Ward, and uh, I really like the opening to this one, actually. It starts with uh, not necessarily action, but there's definitely action within the chapter. You've got a woman and her older son, I think he's about 16 years old, and they're on horseback fleeing into a city. We learn that they've been in battle, basically, and the army has been routed. Uh, it sounds like they may be pretty much the only survivors of it. Uh, they stop at a place to pick up the woman's daughter, who's six years old, and they then flee and try to escape the city. We learn that she is the Dowager Duchess. Uh, there's no indication of how long that's been the case. Uh, we're told that her husband was hanged, but we don't know how long ago it was. We're also told that she is the Phoenix, but we don't know why that nickname, that moniker, has been given to her. But it does obviously play into the cover design that you've got here. Their pursuers are in the city as well and by the time they're leaving with the young girl as well the soldiers are pretty much upon them. They do get cornered at various places. We learn a little bit about the world and local politics with the council who have betrayed this woman. They were the ones who routed her army and we also learn a bit about the magics. We've got a knight who is leading her pursuers who has 
some form of witchcraft and it's noted that although he's part of the council or he's working for the council, I think his father is on this council, if they knew that he had this witchcraft, he would be on the run just like this woman is. We also have these living statues that are giving chase as well and the knight has control over them and they are in the shape of big lions and it's noted that you couldn't kill them with a sword, you'd need a blacksmith's hammer or something along those lines. So it's all very interesting. We do get a few little battles as well in here and it's one that definitely makes me want to read on and see what happens next. Then we've got the one that bridges the gap because this one used to be self-published and is now traditionally published. It was actually a winner of a former SPFBO competition. This is The Grey Bastards by Jonathan French and this one is all about half orcs. The chap on the front cover there is one of these. We have three of these half orcs who so are at a brothel, two male, one female, and uh, one of them wakes up and goes outside because he's been caught by one of his mates and there's riders who are approaching. We again with this one learn a bit about the local politics and the way that the land is uh, kind of separated with various groups of half orcs who are around there and you've got these little uh, kind of cadres of uh, men who are out there as well and then you've got the orcs who believe that they own all the land and the half orcs saying that they're protecting the men from the orcs so it all sounds a little bit kind of unofficial and there's obviously lots of little battles and tussles between those different factions. Uh, the men have obviously got great disdain for this group of half orcs and it leads to a bit of verbal fighting and then there's a bit of physical fighting as well. One of the men is killed and the others are sent back basically to tell the story that he's run away and he's, he's not actually been killed, but the half orcs are gonna try and track him down and bring him back. So I think the chapter itself, it may play a further part depending on who this person was. There are some little hints in there that this dead man was quite important, although all of them are kind of exiles. If they were actually important, they wouldn't be out there, it's noted. So. We don't really know, but it sounds like it's more of a chapter to tell you a little bit about these half orcs and how formidable they are rather than to set up actual story. So again, interested to see where this one goes and how it all develops. So next up is An Ocean of Others by Joshua Scott Edwards, and this one was quite an interesting setting. Uh, on the front here, you've got kind of this glowing blue paper that the guy's holding and that does come into play in the story as well so it gives us a little bit of magic that I'm interested in learning more about uh, but the main character we follow is a bounty hunter it's a first person it's the only one that's in the first person out of the five that I've uh, gone through today um, and he's telling the story about a little bit about the city first of all I guess and you've got this uh, riot which sprang out of nothing it's said several times that nothing kind of started it nothing led to it um, but it nearly brought the city to its knees basically and then you've got this agency that was set up to bring it all under control and you've got the bounty hunter is noted as being one of if not the last bounty hunter in the city he's chasing a thief looking for a pendant that he's stolen basically he doesn't care about the thief he doesn't want to kill him he just wants to get the pendant back for his client so that he can get his pay you then meet one of the fingers they're called of this agency he's kind of an enforcer and he actually catches the thief uh, there's then this magic that comes into play the bounty hunter sees this uh, kind of magic glowing blue bit of paper uh, he manages to get his pendant back but they almost end up burning the city down because this thief has got this kind of uh, i can't remember what it's called hellfire or something like that in him and uh, killing him kind of sets it loose so they have to put out the flames before the surrounding buildings go up but it does lead to kind of a suggestion of friendship between the enforcer and our bounty hunter we're told that because he's the only bounty hunter left they're a dying breed basically he should come and join the agency and work with them and it sounds like he's maybe considering it the city itself sounds quite interesting there's some nice little elements that we see as we're running through chasing after the thief the bounty hunter himself seems to be quite likable he's noted as having friends around the city who kind of point him in the right direction when he loses track of the guy that he's chasing and help him out in other ways so it seems like we've got a nice little setup and the story could be quite intriguing as well. And then finally I've got Blood of an Exile by Brian Naslund and I have to say these uh, traditionally published books, I don't know what the difference is, whether it's uh, costs or otherwise, but these are definitely lighter and a lot easier for me to hold up than the self-published books are. 
little bit of an odd one there. Uh, but with this one, we've got a Dragon Slayer. We focus on a youngish boy. We're not sure, I don't think at this point, what his actual age is. But he's the apprentice of an apothecary, And he's getting everything ready, basically, for a Dragon Slaying. So he and his master will go out with all of their bits and pieces to tend to, basically, the Dragon Slayer, whether he's dead or injured after the Dragon Slaying. Or, as it's expected to be, the attempted dragon slaying so we learn a little bit about the dragons largely through the apothecary kind of testing his apprentice asking him questions which of course he gives all of the correct answers to first time we learn a little bit more when he's talking to the dragon slayer and telling him uh, what type of dragon it is and a little bit about the recent at least history of it the dragon slayer himself is a bit of a legend but he also seems to be quite a bit of a drunk uh, we learn a bit about his legend we hear some of the stories of how he slays all of these dragons which seem impossible but that's kind of how stories and legends are really and then we see the actual dragon itself and the dragon slayer trying to kill it this bit does have a degree of the impossible that's mentioned several times uh, the dragon slaying itself does seem a bit too coincidental but that's kind of all built into i guess the legend that makes up the actual dragon slayer and then because he's injured the apothecary's apprentice is kind of stitching him up and he notices that the wounds start healing themselves the dragon slayer tells him basically that some things you witness could be bad for your health and then the dragon turns out not to be dead kills the apothecary and then the dragon slayer throws a spear with enough force to go straight through its skull and kill it so again the impossible is mentioned and it does give lots of intrigue as to how that all works we also learn again a little bit about the world and how these dragon slayers come about they're marked they've got tattoos on their cheeks they're normally as per the title exiles people who've done something wrong and they've been sentenced basically to go out and try and kill dragons pretty much i guess as a means of getting rid of these guys because as you hear in the story most of the time the dragon slaying is unsuccessful so it's an interesting one it's perhaps a bit of a tired trope with the uh, kind of old uh, seemingly invincible but also drunk warrior but uh, the story itself the writing of it and the uh, the actual world that you hear about is quite interesting so all of these titles have been on my reading list of course i'm interested in reading them all and that's why i've got copies of them and i've put them on my reading plan for the year i think they are all very different stories from at least the well the synopses as well but from the opening chapters that i read of them i've got one which i've heard might be a bit more for the younger reader and that one ascendant did definitely come across that way a little bit it was very easy reading and might be geared to the younger reader but i only read a short chapter um so it's far too early to tell that it certainly seems that it's more open to the younger reader rather than specifically aimed at them but i'll find out whenever i do get to this one i've got a couple that definitely sound a bit more heavy going an ocean of others may be amongst those but the writing of it is really kind of free-flowing and it's nice and uh, really accessible and i think in that one the first person narrative does actually help with that because we get more of the personality really of the main character through that one and he does seem uh, as he's portrayed he does seem to be quite a likeable character one that i think that i could get along fine with when I'm reading the book. With the Grey Bastards and also Blood of an Exile, the two chapters that I read from these seem to be very much scene set in there to tell you more about the person or the characters involved rather than kind of setting the scene itself, so to speak. I could be wrong in that, but they do seem to be more to tell us what type of person we're dealing with here with the trio of orcs, or half orcs rather, and with the uh, legendary kind of drunkard, slightly magic, I don't know dragon slayer both of those because they tell us more about the characters and less about what i expect the story to be are a bit more difficult for me to judge the characters seemed okay although as i say the kind of drunkard of the dragon slayer in blood of an exile does seem a little bit kind of worn for me it's not one of the ones that i tend to prefer the half orcs didn't really give me anything beyond showing me how kind of not brutal they are but how formidable as i say they are how how they can stand up for themselves and how they're not to be messed with both of those stories are quite interesting for me but they definitely need to show me a bit more which would come over the next chapters rather than what they show me in the opening chapter 
The one that I think worked best for me then, and the one that I'll put on my April reading plan, because it's uh, already time for me to start thinking about that one, I guess, is Legacy of Ash by Matthew Ward, which is, as I say, quite a chunky one. It's 750 plus pages, 770 or so. Um, but I have heard some pretty good things about this one. It's a military fantasy from what I'm told as well, and I do get along with those quite well as a general rule but I just thought the opening of it worked really well for me it put us into the action but it gave us plenty of detail I didn't feel lost with it at any point for being kind of thrown in at the deep end uh, so I'm definitely excited to read all of these but I think this one is the one that spoke to me the most from the opening chapter and I'll be picking up first out of this little batch. So that was a real mixed bag of titles in terms of the story and the feel of them rather than any of them being necessarily uh, good or bad because I think they were all pretty decent opening chapters just some of them obviously worked a little bit better for me. I am as I say looking forward to reading all of these and will be doing so or aiming to at least this year because they are all part of my reading plan for the year so you can look forward to my thoughts on all of these books over the coming months but uh, yeah Legacy of Ash I'm looking forward to reading in April so you can hear my thoughts on that one first of all. In the comments down below let me know if you've read any of these. How do my thoughts on the opening chapters reflect to the rest of the book in your opinions? Are there any of the other ones at least that you think I should put ahead of the others and prioritise? Thanks very much for tuning in I appreciate you as always. I hope to see you in the next video sometime soon but until then as always take care of yourselves, read some good books. Bye for now.